change, pardon the pun, the whole complexion of America. Am I wrong? No, you're right. The second they thing... They want to break down the white Christian male power structure, of which you're a part, and so am I. And they they white supremacists may find my next guest offensive. Most people, black and white, participate in white supremacy unknowingly. It is not necessarily their fault because our whole society has been structured around the anti-factual belief in white superiority. Since white supremacy is wrong according to the laws of logic, physics, biology, history, and mathematics, the only way it can possibly be supported is through lies and propaganda. The easiest way to refute white supremacy is to simply embrace the truth about everything. And since white supremacy is untrue, it simply fades away when facing the light of truth. This series of videos will expose the truth as it relates to white supremacy. The topic here is slavery. Studying slavery does not mean you are dwelling on the past. Jews are not told to forget about the Holocaust. Americans are not told to forget about Pearl Harbor. And therefore, blacks should not be told to forget about slavery. There are a variety of white supremacist myths related to slavery. One of the primary myths is that slavery in Africa was somehow similar to slavery in America. The other slave myth is that blacks willingly sold each other into slavery. The reason why these myths are white supremacists is because they are designed to morally purge the white population of its past. These are the myths that will be refuted in this video. We are given to believe that slavery is slavery. In other words, everything called slavery belongs in the same category. That is like saying lions and ant lions and sea lions all belong in the same category. It is important to remember that African serfdom was identical to feudalism, while American chattel slavery was a multi-generational torture camp. There were a number of writers who traveled to Africa during slavery, leaving behind written records. Those who visited the area now known as Ghana saw the Asante tribe. In the 16 and 1700s, the Asante lived in a system identical to feudalism. At the top was the Asante Hine. Below him were the paramount chiefs, then the subordinate chiefs, then the farmers. In this system, slavery or serfdom was that the peasants were required to bring vegetables to the local chiefs. In the area now known as Northern Nigeria, the house estates had a similar system of feudalism in the 11 to 1200s AD. In the area of Lake Chad, the Bornu had a similar system of feudalism in the 1400s. The same was true in any part of Africa where there was so-called slavery. It was actually feudalism, not chattel slavery. Slavery as we know it today did not exist in Africa. In East Africa, there was another form of slave which was a person owned by the very wealthy. They were known as the Abid. Their high price made the market much smaller than the slave market in America. To illustrate the difference between the Abid and the American chattel slave, the Abid lived a life similar to the character Jeffrey from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, while the American chattel slaves lived a life similar to a victim in the Saw movie series. In short, it is misleading and inaccurate to say that blacks were already slaves in Africa. There was only one place in Africa where slaves were economically important. That was in the Songhai Empire's capital city of Gayo in the 1500s. Nowhere else and nowhere else did African serfdom involve forced agricultural and industrial labor. People who visited Africa were shocked at how humane African serfdom was compared to chattel slavery. For example, in 1704, a Dutch trade commissioner by the name of Bosman went to the Gold Coast and observed that many so-called slaves, quote, have more authority than their masters. As another example, Martin Delaney, who was a black Harvard-trained doctor, explorer, and army major, traveled to West Africa between July 1859 and August 1860, and he wrote, it is simply preposterous to talk about slavery as that term is understood, either being legalized or existing in this part of Africa. 
It is nonsense. The English explorer Rattray visited the Asante of West Africa and wrote, A slave might marry, own property, himself own a slave, swear an oath, be a competent witness, and ultimately become heir to his master. Slaves have the ordinary privileges of an Asante free man. In 1897, M. Kingsley described African slavery as, quote, a state of servitude guarded by rights. Also, African slaves frequently became rulers. For example, the Bambara Kingdom of Upper Nigeria around 1700 was ruled by a series of slave generals. This is just a small fraction of the evidence, and literally all of the evidence is consistent with the fact that there was no similarity between African serfdom and American chattel slavery. Another myth is that black people willingly sold each other into slavery. The truth is that Africans became trapped in a gun slave cycle. In 1567, John Hawkins allied himself with several African kings, and he used those alliances to create wars against other African kings. Hawkins, along with 200 of his men and his new African allies, seized an African city. Hawkins came away with 470 captives and sold them into slavery. This trend of Europeans causing wars in Africa became common. Once at war, the Africans became desperate for more and more weapons. The Europeans started purposely giving guns to one side but not the other. This was done to throw off the military balance of the area and to initiate a gun slave cycle. Once they gave guns to one side, they then sold guns to the other side. When they sold guns, they did not take money. They only took humans in exchange for guns. Thus, the only way to get more guns was to sell humans. This trend continued on so long that the British government and East India Company became wealthy from the sale of guns to desperate Africans. By the time chattel slavery reached its peak, Birmingham, England was sending 150,000 guns into Africa annually. Numerous African kings attempted to put an absolute end to slavery, but it was too late. They had already allowed themselves to be tricked by their enemy, and as a result, they watched their civilization get torn to pieces. Black people sold each other into slavery for self-protection, not for profit. We allowed ourselves to be tricked then, and we often allow ourselves to be tricked now. The purpose of reviewing our history is to learn lessons from our history. Whether or not history repeats itself depends on you. The choice is yours. Peace. In the context of admissions to our elite universities and graduate schools, is it time to end affirmative action? First, affirmative action is a euphemism for admitting blacks and Hispanics to selective universities despite wide gaps in SAT scores and grades. Discriminating on the basis of race is inherently unfair and offensive, particularly when it's done by governments. The beneficiaries of affirmative action are not the truly disadvantaged. They are most... Affirmative action is one of the biggest causes for anger being wrongly directed toward the black community. The prevailing belief is that qualified white people are having their jobs taken away from them by dumb, lazy black people. This is actually part of a larger mythology called the social parasite theory. This prevailing belief is that black people play the role of a leech or parasite to society and that blacks are sucking the lifeblood out of white society primarily by taking jobs that they don't deserve and receiving money that they didn't work for. At the very core of this belief is the idea that white people are being held back from having their perfect white society because non-whites keep messing everything up. This video will focus on the white supremacist mythology surrounding affirmative action. The affirmative action myth is that intelligent, hard-working, and well-trained white people are losing their jobs and university acceptances to unqualified black people. It is very important to remember that the social reaching perspective does not come from observation of actual events. It is entirely based on political rhetoric. In other words, it is a perceived threat rather than an actual problem. Every year, 
thousands of white people get rejected from prestigious universities. After receiving their rejection notices in the mail, many of them immediately begin to fantasize that an unqualified black person got accepted over them. This is their perception, yet it does not match reality. In September 2007, the Boston Globe newspaper reported on research done by ETS. The company did a study on the top 146 colleges in the United States. They compared each school's requirements to the actual admissions statistics. Student qualifications included GPA, standardized test scores, and letters of recommendation. The study found that white people with a bad GPA Poor standardized test scores and weak letters of recommendation were actually more likely to be found on these top 146 college campuses than minorities who depended on affirmative action. In fact, unqualified white people are nearly twice as numerous at these universities than their equally unqualified minority counterparts. These findings represent and reflect the trends of many colleges across the United States and Europe. This fact completely contradicts the myths about affirmative action and university acceptances. In addition to the study, decades of sociological research combined with labor statistics reveal that it is actually the white woman who is the largest beneficiary of affirmative action. This means that the primary effect of affirmative action is resources going from the white community to the white community. Now, it is not a problem for the white community to give itself resources. The problem is all of the misdirected anger, animosity, and blame going toward black people. This is not an accident. The system was designed to preserve white wealth while maintaining the myth that America is somehow a land of equal opportunity. Ironically, many of the politicians who hated black people actually became very involved with the civil rights movement and the development of its legal foundation. This worked out perfectly for white supremacy because many people feared that the black community would gain more power once legal restrictions against blacks had been lifted. The key issue at hand was the concept of minority. This is because the definition of words like minority had a huge effect on how social programs would influence the allocation of resources. In the early 1960s, the concept of minority was defined based on ethnicity, religion, and national origin. Everybody knew that it was ridiculous to call white women a minority according to any definition. For example, if minority is defined in terms of quantity, then white women are not a minority because they belong to the most numerous gender and also the most numerous race of people in America. If minority is defined in terms of the workforce, then that would not make sense during an age when domestic jobs were the norm for women. Women were not expected to populate the workforce in high numbers anyway. If minority is defined in terms of access to resources, then white women are still not a minority because the resources are held by the white woman's father, husband, uncle, brother, and son. White men and white women don't live in two separate communities. They live in the same communities and they share the same resources. Therefore, white women are not a minority in any sense of the word. So this raises the question of why white women legally became minorities in the first place. In the late 1950s, there was a growing fear that civil rights would eventually lead to resources being channeled into the black community. Congressman Howard Smith of Virginia was one of many politicians working to make sure that this would never happen. For example, he actively blocked civil rights legislation in 1957, declaring that, quote, the Southern people have never accepted the colored race as a race of people who has equal intelligence as the white people of the South. He continued to fight against civil rights legislation for many years. In 1964, Congressman Howard Smith offered a bill that would add gender to the list of discriminations. To push this amendment, he brought in a made-up letter supposedly written by a woman. As he read the letter out loud, the other congressmen thought it was ridiculous and the chambers of Congress filled up with laughter. 
Later, Representative Carl Elliott from Alabama stated, Smith didn't give a damn about women's rights. The fact of the matter is, the white woman's liberation movement created a way where white wealth could be preserved along with the American myth of equal opportunity. Affirmative action is practiced in a way that mostly benefits the white population, and it is talked about in a way that redirects anger toward the black population. This is the nature of American politics. Real politics always operates on a street level and has a grassroots agenda. Real affirmative action happens when the black community affirms its own power and takes direct action within itself. America's help will never be a match to knowledge of self.